So I'd like to welcome Michael Ma. Thank you. Boy, making me blush. <laughs> making me blush. Okay, can everyone hear me? All right. What do you think about that? <laughs> Thanks for inviting me back. All right. Uh, I came up with this title because I think there is a game change going on here. There's a big market shift. Um, and I've, I've got uh, the pleasure, the privilege of being kind of like a honeybee that goes around different fields and gets to be witness. So what's good about this talk is it's not me pontificating about what I think. It's more about sharing stories about what I see. And so that I think is fundamentally more interesting um, because I'm not very good about pontificating. Um, but Kent Beck is. And uh, I met Kent, uh, who is the father of extreme programming, when he was a writer for the Cutter Consortium, was a think tank that uh, I also write for. And um, at the time, a lot of what he said was heretical. Right? It was extreme. That's why they called it extreme programming. I mean, think of this extreme idea. Uh, put smart people in, together in one space. Have them sit next to each other and work on one thing. I mean, that's radical. And uh, so the, the, the notion of that was a promise. A promise, as he said, if it works, if, if we were to find out if it w would work, we'd be able to get more software and have it be clean code. It would work better. Right? We'd be able to build more capability with fewer defects. So that's the quality angle to this. And I don't think a lot of people focused on it in the beginning. I certainly did. Um, uh, a funny story about Kent was that I got him into J.P. Morgan Chase, which at the time was a very stodgy, waterfall bank in lower Manhattan, because I'd been there for quite a number of years. And they wanted to do an agile transformation. So uh, I said, OK, let's get Kent in. So he, he was in there. And some interesting conversations happened among people in strange locations. So he's at the, in the men's room, and he's standing at the urinal. And one of the project sponsors is also standing at the urinal. For you ladies, this is where some pretty serious stuff gets talked about, just to let you know. <laughs> so this guy says, uh, you know, we have this really great process document, which we worked on quite a bit. I'd be curious to know what you think we sh how we should use it. And uh, Ken said, well, you could use it over in that stall over there to wipe your butt. <laughs> and, you know, Kent was heretical, so he didn't last very long at J.P. Morgan Chase, unfortunately. <laughs> So, uh, but anyway, his message, his message was quite interesting. It sh this should work. Um, I had an interesting experience in my career working on this machine when I first got out of college. This is a Tried 2 nuclear submarine. I was fascinated with aerospace and the Apollo program when I was a kid. My father was a Wall Street banker when it was an honorable profession. Um, Kind of like the story of Pursuit of Happiness, actually. You know, he kind of did the Rubik's Cube thing for somebody was where he was tending bar, and the next thing you knew, he was a Wall Street trader. But he was a quantitative analyst, so I would see him look at charts and uh, look at fundamentals and make decisions based on visuals. So I guess I got that. But I was about wanting to make stuff uh, and got into physics and engineering. So I found myself on this project where uh, it was probably one of the most complex software projects in the world, and this was my introduction to software quality. And the reason why I found it an incredible first start to my career was because we had to build really clean code. I mean, if you have buggy code in the navigation system of a nuclear submarine two football fields long, and Tom Clancy just passed away, by the way, so if you haven't read Hunt for Red October or things like that, it's a great read. Um, if you have bugs in the code that flies a nuclear submarine underwater around undersea caverns, mountains, Grand Canyons, because from the top the ocean looks like it's just this flat thing, but underneath it's like Yosemite, right? There are deep chasms, there are areas in the ocean that you can't ever explore, they're so deep. And so we have to navigate this, this uh, machine through places like that. And uh, a bug in the code is really bad. Uh, especially when you have 24 missiles, each with six multiple entry warheads, 
where each warhead has the firepower of two to four hundred Hiroshima's. And little me, 24, 5 years old, is working with uh, a lot of these scientists to design and test the navigation system with sonars, undersea sonars, gyros, everything to be able to fly this boat. And um, we had to build clean code and get the bugs out. So this is one of the things that I learned about, about software quality. I came across some of the research by Larry Putnam, who is one of the founders and original great thinkers of software measurement and estimation. And in his papers, he talked about how the rate of work follows a Rayleigh curve. The, the typical rate at which people are staffed on the projects follows a Rayleigh curve. A Rayleigh curve is named after a British mathematician, and it simply means build up to a peak and it has a long tail. And this is a Rayleigh curve of software bugs. Happens to be one of uh, a company that's a case study later on, BMC Software in Austin, Texas. But this is the breakdown of their bugs for two-week sprints, broken down by severity category by color, but you see it builds up to a peak, they find and fix, and then is a tail. Now, uh, as a quality person, this is really important to you because think about how painful it is when you're on a project, a certain amount of code, and this curve is tall and long, right? This is like QA testing hell, as opposed to short and compact, which is much better. Now imagine if you're viewed as a QA professional as, you guys just worry about testing on the back end. Meanwhile, we have a date. We're going to just go start writing the code. And then this curve starts building up. And every one of you on your projects has a curve, whether you know it or not, whether you're measured or not. It's there. You just may or may not know it. And then you're tasked with dealing with a big fat you know, section of the curve at the end, you know, called QA testing, perhaps. And then you have a deadline. So this was my hot seat on the Trident II nuclear submarine navigation system. And when we were delivering for this date, it was actually for the SALT II you know, arms negotiations with the then Soviet Union, which was going to talk about dismantling all the stuff that we're building, interestingly. But um, we found that we were able to model this with better than 90% accuracy, the defect rate found found and fixed with some mathematical algorithms that Larry Putnam created, which is now in a model called the SLIM model, Software Lifecycle Management, and that was my first experience with it. So this is something that still is relevant today. And when we were working on that nuclear submarine program, we wanted to shrink this curve and shorten it. The way we did it was some pretty crazy ideas back then. We paired people in teams of two. We did work in short cycles. We actually wrote the tests before we wrote the code. And I know because I had to write the tests. And as a young engineer, that was kind of a daunting test because the epic that drove all of the test cases that had to be written to verify that the system was doing its job was something called the Trident II scenario document. And you had to have top secret clearance to go read the book, read the scenario document, you got the document, you were in a locked room, and you got to open it up. And from here, we had to make sure that we covered all of the tests to cover this scenario. This scenario was the end of the world. OK? And so it's a launch sequence. And I remember sitting in that room all by myself and going, what am I reading here? You know, it had all the targeting information, a lot of Vostok, Moscow, everywhere. and so. After I got through that, I had to go out and write tests. And we wrote tests that were designed to go right to the operation of the system as it launched missiles. And we had to make sure that we traced all the test specs and procedures to requirements. Today, they'd be called stories. We'd write these tests in advance because they would constitute the acceptance test criteria that would basically say we've delivered a ship. So we were doing something called acceptance test-driven development. But it was agile before agile was cool. All right? And this is not, so what I'm starting off with this here, and I'm spending a little bit more time on this, is because your takeaway today 
regardless of whether you're doing Agile or not, is this doesn't belong to Agile. In the 1980s, this practice didn't belong to anyone who sat around in Salt Lake City and came up with this manifesto idea, okay? Or even the practices that we talk about today. And the way QA made itself relevant to this conversation back then on this project was we put ourselves in the front. We said, you know what, this idea of being like at the back end while you guys write the code and we got the deadline, we have to test like hell, that doesn't work. So we want to put ourselves up in the front because we believe that we have a role in being able to shape how the code is built so that ultimately when we test it, we're ready to go and we're testing it on ships that go out of Cape Canaveral and simulate submarine maneuvers while the Russians watch with binoculars, which is one of the things that I got to plan as well. So that's one of the takeaways I'd like for you. You guys aren't just the folks at the back end cleaning up someone's junky code. You need to be at the front end to be able to start mapping how you're actually going to verify that the system works so that they write it and build it in a way that it will work properly. And if you have this Rayleigh curve and you are putting yourself at the front, you will shrink it. All right? You won't let all the stuff build up into all the stuff that's not right and then have to test it out and get it right because it's wrong. You'll be getting it right earlier and the peak of the curve will be sooner and then that long tail will be shorter. And so if you have a schedule deadline that you're thinking of, what do you think happens to your schedule deadline or your ability to meet your schedule if the curve is big and fat? Right? What do you think? What do you think your chances are of making your date if the curve, really bug curve, is tall and long? Not very good, right? Not very good. What do you think you have a chance of making your schedule if your really curve is short and compact? You're going to make your date, right? And so this will determine the quality of your life, too, at that last part of this project. Uh, so that's one of the things that's fascinating, too, because Jim Highsmith and I talk about this. Jim Highsmith was one of the signers of the Agile Manifesto. And he said, we used to just go like crazy to make the date and test like crazy to try to get the bugs out. If we invert that and turn it on its head and we get the bugs out early and we write really clean code, we get our date. So rather than focusing on schedule and hope for quality, we focus on quality and we get schedule. All right? And that's how to make a QA professional relevant to the issue of schedule, and not blamed for the fact that the software hasn't been fully tested and we have to ship it with known bugs, right? Because we're really sick of the blame game. So this is the operating console for the navigation control console, the NCC. These are the helmsmen with the captain of the ship. And you can see there are no windows, and there's a whole lot of switches and a whole lot of buttons. We actually wrote the test by using the NOPS, the Navigational Operational Procedures, which is what the sailors have to follow when they go from 3SQ, 2SQ, 1SQ launch. Okay, so we really took it from the user perspective. So, you know, when uh, the helmsman, you know, signals to go to a certain keel depth and set the ship at a certain velocity, a certain speed, just below the surface, ideal for launching a missile. I mean, all of these things actually govern uh, the operating of the software, which is how we wrote the test and they wrote the code. Today, I fly something with very few instruments. <laughs> so navigation was my passion then. I'm a pilot, and this is a Piper Cub. It's only got three gauges. Uh, it's got a uh, tachometer, speedometer, and an altimeter. And uh, there's no software in it. And it's great fun to fly. Um, so navigation is still a passion of mine. Uh, this is actually my plane, uh, which I fly around in. No software in this all steam gauges, vacuums, and all that. And uh, that's a really favorite view of mine, a really short runway with water at the end of it. <laughs> you better get it right. <laughs> I'm teaching my son to get it right. He's a pilot in the middle. He's 17, he soloed at 16. That's my daughter over there. And we fly around in this family car with two wings on it. So uh, that's one of my passions, just as a little tidbit about uh, engineering and fun stuff. Okay, let's get to software, let's get to data, let's get to Agile. Uh, these stars on this map here happen to be where I've got a whole bunch of case studies and you're going to see them today. You're going to see real data 
what we're seeing in Kent Beck's terms. Are we seeing schedule? Are we seeing bug rates? And uh, let's start the story. So, because I'm just basically a storyteller. And I take pictures. But I can do that because I'm Asian. I get away with it. I just take pictures. <laughs> I've already taken some pictures of you guys. You're in one of my next talks. All right, so all these stories we're now taking on the road. And uh, as was mentioned earlier, one of the first case studies of this was 10 years ago uh, in Las Vegas at the Better Software Conference. Since then, we've been going around either the Cutter Conference, that's Tom DeMarco there, one of my mentors and good friends, uh, the Path to Agility in Columbus, Ohio, the OOP Conference in Munich, Germany, is uh, a place where I keynote a couple of times. And uh, we're bringing that inform all the information about the states and Agile there, too. So this is starting to go global. That's me with short hair. My grandmother's kind of freaking out right now these days. You know, cause <laughs> what are you doing? She's 97 years old. Anyway, uh, at the base of this, the foundation of this, is a database, a library. 12,000 projects that we've been collecting now in our QSM research with our partners in Asia and Europe and North America. And all this stuff starts streaming in our SLIM database, our library. And we're getting everything from, you know, well, we used to get nuclear submarine program data through avionics, aviation, Boeing jets, uh, military systems, diagnostic medical systems, uh, factory automation, business banking insurance, all the way across the ecosystem. And now we've got 12,000 projects. And what we actually do is we take this radical idea and we say, we're going to push this information to the desktop. We're not going to keep it to ourselves and say, if you want to know how to do this, you have to hire us. We actually put it into the SLIM model, and all of these trends are on the user's machine. So if you wanted to do the kind of things that are in this talk, you could do it. Just rent the library, and then I'll show you how to do it. In fact, tomorrow's workshop is to teach you some of the things that I do as a consultant. Because you really don't need me. Right? I can show you some of these things, which are basic, uh, some simple tricks, and then we can do it ourselves. And then when we get all this information flowing into this vast library, it's kind of like the wisdom of crowds. And so everybody gets the information, because none of us is as smart as all of us. Right? So when we all see this stuff together, there's some interesting patterns that we can all look at. And that's what we're going to look at today. And then companies in this uh, data library are just a sample. You know, These are folks that are in our world. Um, and it's a partial list. But for all of them, software is really strategic, really important. And there's no one that's not looking at Agile or practices that they can include in whatever they want to call it. At one large insurance company with a lipstick lady in an apron who shall not be named, uh, they call it the SDM methodology. They don't stick an Agile label on it. And they have their way of talking about pairing and test-driven development, things like that. Slim Metrics is the center of this pyramid where we use this data in benchmarking. So when we want to look at historical measures on projects that have finished. This is where we do these comparisons. We slap on you know, schedules, uh, team headcount sizes, bug rates, things like that, across small, medium, large projects on a trend. And we see whether they are above or below trend. But there are two other technologies that also use historical data that's uh, really important. And that's estimating. And that's also in-flight tracking. So you're started, you've already got you know, part way through, you want to know where you are, where you're going, you can benchmark mid-flight. So that makes up this idea of the total life cycle of managing software, which quality professionals do have a voice in. So when we see that there are patterns that are starting to emerge from our recent past, and we want to be able to communicate that to our management and stakeholders, because it's going to be really important to know in planning for the future, you know, we all have a role in all of this. So this all started, as I mentioned before, with a fellow named Jim Highsmith. Have any of you uh, seen or heard of some of Jim's book, books, Agile Project Management, things like that? Jim was a, is a pretty prolific writer, one of the co-signers of the manifesto. And at the Cutter conferences where we would speak, he took a, a position at the time when 
numbers started rolling in, saying, ah, we don't need no stinking metrics. You know, that's a waterfall heavy practice. It's an overhead, it's a bureaucratic thing. And I said, Jim, you know, without metrics, you're just someone else with another opinion. Who's going to believe you radicals, all right? Because people who make decisions on whether they should be adopted or not want to see some numbers. And so we kind of went at it for a while, and then we realized, wow, we really could put this together. Like, you know, you're my peanut butter, or I'm his peanut butter to his chocolate. One great candy. And interestingly, uh, when people were starting to consider these radical ideas of Agile, Scrum, XP, the people who wrote the check would say, prove it. I want to see some measures associated with an Agile transformation because at the bottom line, I have to see increased efficiency, higher productivity, and better quality, right? Which is what Kent Beck says, right? So, um, in Toronto, Canada, where there was a company that was building medical devices, they were writing code that goes inside instruments for hospital labs. And there was a fellow named John Sierra who was creating a whole different breakdown of uh, his environment, putting everybody one, in one place, getting rid of the cubicles, getting rid of the siloed offices, and having all kinds of stuff visible and transparent for the world to see. But his management said, we won't do it unless you can show us a before and after. So I got to meet John, and he gave me a tour of the uh, area and showed me all of the different things that they were working on that everybody could see so that it wasn't locked up inside people's desks. And it turns out that a lot of the measures that they were collecting and posting on the board fit right into SLIM. All right, so when they were looking at velocity charts and burn-up charts, that was the buildup of the amount of size of the delivered functionality. And when we were looking at headcount, we could capture the effort and the hours that were spent to build this code. And when we were looking at stories and story point sizing, that was a nice thing that Agile teams did that quantified things about what the teams were actually working on. And then finally, they were always testing and they were always writing it down. So contrary to Jim Highsmith saying that we don't need no stinking metrics, Agile teams were being more disciplined on getting measures than, quote, waterfall teams. So we had size of what was delivered, time and effort to make it, and the goodness of it, the quality of it. That's the core essential measures that we benchmark in our database. So this was the first thing we did. People are speed obsessed, time obsessed. So we plotted two waterfall traditional projects, which, you know, they're on a large end. They were building a few hundred thousand lines of code. And we plotted their schedules, 10 months, 15 months, 20 months, whatever, on a trend line against the QSM database for medical systems. And if you're a highly skilled metrics analyst, you find out whether those dots are below the line, which is faster than the trend, or above the line, which is longer, because the vertical axis here is longer, going down is faster. So you, as skilled analysts now, you could read off and say, for this project, how many months faster, since it's below the line, is it compared to the QSM database? And you can read it, a few months, or something like that. In a tool, you can actually highlight it and it could pull up an XY coordinate. And then on the left here were these smaller releases that were in the new environment where teams were paired, they were co-located, working on one thing, not multitasking, right, all in one room. And so they're on the smaller end because they were building uh, smaller pieces of functionality and releasable code was being shipped sooner. And we plotted those schedules. And even though these are disparately different sizes, we could compare whether they're faster than the industry average schedule line by seeing if they're below the equator or above. So you can see, how would you read that? You'd say, okay, these two traditional waterfall projects are faster than the norm, but so are these, and these two even more so. So this is six months compared to an industry average of 10 months. Wait a minute, that's like almost cutting the time in half, right? So it's 40% faster. And then you would want to see whether this is happening again and again, and then add in more dots to this uh, constellation, right? But I'll tell you, these three projects use small teams of people co-located. These two projects use giant numbers, hordes of people, 
trying to compress the date. So I'll ask you a QA question. When you compress schedule by throwing lots of people on a project, do you think bugs go down or do they go up? See, you guys already know the question. Now, here's a second one that's a little bit more tricky. If you double headcount to try to compress schedule, do you think bugs go up linearly in step with the headcount? No. No. So you've probably been reading the research that says, no, it actually goes up geometrically, more like the square of the team size, actually. So if you double the headcount, bugs go up, actually, about four times. So your defect density tends to go up by a factor of four, amount of bugs per thousand lines of code. Right, the total number of bugs that you tend to have to deal with in QA and testing, instead of, say, 300 bugs, could be 1,200. Just by going out this Mongolian horde approach, you get schedule. And then you got the QA team gets to have that. Lucky you. Lucky us, right? So did that come out in the data? Yes. So this is now a trend line for defects. And these are now the plots of the bugs found and fixed during QA against the industry average center line. And the hash lines are the upper and lower bell curve. What do you see? The waterfall projects are almost double twice the the number compared to the average. What about the agile ones? Well, if you draw a line through these, they're about half. So now, if you go from a before scenario where your bugs are double average, and then the after scenario where your bugs are half, what's the end-to-end -end defect reduction? A factor of what? Four. Four. You've cut bugs by a factor of four. That's a big deal. So to go from 1,000 bucks to 250, just as an example, changes the life of people in QA. And the, the lives are changed because they got involved in the front end, right? Writing tests before code, being involved in each sprint. OK, so data says, Kent, you got it. We got speed, but we also got higher quality. So the promise is met. And the XP transformation that people like Joshua Karievsky and Jim Highsmith helped this company do, met the target. And we were able to measure it. Measure it. Reese's peanut butter cups for everybody. So they're in the field of medical. Why is this important to them? Because they say their software saves lives. So now the whole idea about, well, why are we doing this? What's your purpose? What's your why? Why are you doing the work that you're doing? Because you know what? We're all going to die. You know, and we really want to have some meaning for what we do while we're here, have some fun along the way, and make a difference. So in medical systems, you could be involved in uh, software for you know, a similar purpose. You could be dealing with software or technology that helps with the challenges of the environment. You could be building software that deals with energy and uh, you know, transportation and things like this. This is a gas station in Oslo, Norway, and I took this picture and I translated the krona per liter into dollars. It was 11 bucks a gallon, right? It's only going to keep going up. We have to have technology that finds alternative ways of producing energy and moving us around. Uh, so you might be doing stuff like that. Uh, you might be dealing with the fact that the world is becoming a more crowded place, and there's an increasing number of difficult challenges to solve. Uh, moving goods around, taking care of the needs of an increasingly larger or older population. You might be teaching children. Could be in a third world country where there's very little education for women and children. Uh, or you could be doing it here in the United States. So that could be your why. And whenever I think about what I'm doing, I always say, what's my why? What is my why? So this is the why education of children for this one next company. I'll take you on a tour of this metrics data. This is Follett Software in McHenry, Illinois. Uh, then we'll look at Austin, Texas, BMC Software. Two case studies. One is XP, one is Scrum. All right. So this is a team that's co-located. Follett Software is one of the companies that's named after the original founders. That's a family name. Uh, they are in the business of educating children. 
Uh, they build systems that satisfy the classroom needs of K through 12 schools. They're like the Amazon.com of the educational systems marketplace. And they went into this XP transformation. This is a pair of programmers working with a user uh, proxy, so somebody who acts as a user. The smallest molecule uh, in this particular environment of the team, a pair of programmers and people saying, I want the software to do this for these stories. This is the way the room looks. It was actually kind of noisy. They found that they had to deal with challenges they didn't anticipate, like lack of privacy. Um, a ping pong table right behind there was constantly rattling around. You start to see people like with noise canceling headphones these days in some of these large rooms, which I'm finding more and more. Um, interestingly, because their why is in educating children, one of the things they actually adopted as part of their work uh, style and their work philosophy is you have to go home to your children and help them with their homework. We're about helping kids get through school, and we don't want you working overtime. So we'll take that Ken Peck, th Peck thing about 40-hour work weeks, and we'll actually be serious about it. You're not allowed to work late. Go home, have dinner with the kids, and do homework with them. And they actually said, as a reminder to that, we'd like you to put pictures around of your kids. So interestingly, I noticed that underneath a lot of their monitors were photographs of their children. Because that was always being, they were being reminded of the why that they were working. So it's bad to be, like in the old model, a workaholic, because by working 60 hours you're a team player. Here, it's good if you leave and go home to your kids. They don't want burned out people. In my office on Friday at 3 o'clock, just for kicks, I say, it's 3 o'clock. If you're working, you're fired. <laughs> this is an agile release, uh, and it's a sketch. It's my scribbly handwriting when I interviewed their teams when they wanted to do a benchmarking engagement. And we charted this story work for a mid-December through January, February, March, April, May, June period with two people focused on writing stories. We call that the equivalent of the requirements phase. And so the amount of effort by those two people over, uh, uh, let's see, two people over the course of one, two, three, four, five and a half months is 11, 11 person months. I get that by two people times 5.5 is 11 person months. And there's a certain amount of working hours if you work a 40 hour work week in one month. So we could compute the amount of effort that they spent in requirements and stories. They started sprint one here with a team of 20 people and went one, two, three months with 20 people and then another one, two, three and a half months with 26 people to build 83 user stories, 250 story points and a certain amount of working code that delivered the functionality for those stories. So now we have three metrics, elapsed time, we have the effort, and then the fruits of the labor, the size of the release in terms of story, story points, and code. We also have bug counts. How many bugs did you find in your final QA testing here? And that's the fourth. So those of you who are joining me tomorrow in the workshop session, we're going to show you how to do it yourself, get some of the metrics on your Agile releases. You're going to do sketches like this. I'm going to show you how to draw this out and how to get the information and keep it recorded in the data record, save the file, and then we'll see whether, hey, when we finish this thing in six months, is six months longer than the industry average? Is it faster? Is it right on the middle? When you use 20, 25 people, is that a larger team of folks? Is it a smaller? Or is it right on the average? Okay. When you found and fixed 120 bugs, because the 200 number here had to be updated, there was a bunch of dupes that were double counted, is that fewer defects, more? We're right on the average. So this is like the Goldilocks and the Three Bears style of benchmarking, right? Too cold, too hot, just right. And so we drop this into the data record in our data manager library. We just pop it right in there. It takes about three, four minutes to put in. We'll write in a little description. We'll put all of the metrics in here, start and end date for those different phases, the peak head count, uh, the person months of effort the delivered functionality and stories, story points and code or what have you, or use cases or function points or whatever you want, and we'll save the file. 
When we do that three, four, five, six times, and we want to ask ourselves a question, what were the bugs during testing against the industry average? I'm cutting to the end of the story here because that was data record for release 5.0. We had 6.0, and those are the dots against the trend line because now you know how to read a trend line. And when we put a line through Follett's data and compared it against the trend, what do you see? A few defects or more? I kind of gave you the answer. Right? Fewer. By about 50 to 60 percent below industry. So if the industry average is 100, they're finding 50 or 66. Why? What do you think? What about pair programming, for example, might result in fewer bugs in the code? Anyone got any ideas? Someone looking over your shoulder as Payson says that to see defects as they're made. So if somebody's writing up and one person is flying and one person's writing and the other person's watching, ah, another set of eyes. Hey, miss something here. Oh, okay. It's like an instant code review, right? Any other ideas? With this co-located team, one room? Different levels of knowledge. Uh, and there are other people with those levels of knowledge within a spinner of your chair around behind you, right? So let's say you're working on a module and you know it interfaces with another one and you've got a question about the other team, what they're working on. You say, hey, Joe, you know, I'm writing this interface to you and blah, blah, blah. Can I ask you a question about data formatting and da, da, da? You get it right away, right? Okay. So we got co-located people in one room working on one thing, working on one thing. What do you think happens to bugs if you multitask? They go down or up? Up. We find they go up in a dramatic way. So this is a team co-located working on one thing, right? One other thing Follett did was they said, okay, we're going to do this grand XP experiment. All of you with lots of experience, we really want you to stay. We don't want you to say, oh, I don't want to live through this. I'm going to go job shopping and put my resume out. So they kept and they incentivized their most experienced people to stick around. What do you think that does to defects? Makes it go down or up? Go down. Because you have people who have deep knowledge of the lineage and the history of this code that they may be modifying because they wrote it last time. So they go right to the chase and the young engineer who's a newbie knows to ask the most experienced person, Sally or Joe, about the architecture of it. Even if there's no spec or not a lot of comments, there are people there. So, hey, 50 to 60 percent below industry. What about schedule? Half. Obviously, if your Rayleigh curve is shrunken, you're going to make your date, you're going to do it. And it turned out that it was 50 percent faster on average. When you include the requirements phase, uh, maybe about 60 percent faster. Uh, 40% faster, but we're still talking fast. And so this one slide was the slide that I was asked because I had half an hour to present to the CEO. They said, can you tell the whole story of this in one slide? I said, one slide? I said, this talk here has got 70 slides. <laughs> one slide. So I said, all right, here it is. If you did it industry average, your cost, your schedule, your QA defects and your staffing is this column, this is your column, that's the difference. You're doing it four and a half months faster, 1.3 million cheaper for every release you do over, say, seven releases in the course of a year. So if you do the math, it's what? Seven times 1.3 million less cost, right? That's a lot of money. But what's more important is that getting to market, say, in six months versus 10, and they're capturing revenue for a whole bunch of months faster. So in the end, the value story of this was that they hit market share that was over 50% like crazy. Quick, story, quick end of the story was they were given money to double down to expand their agile development. And they were also on an acquisition to purchase their competitors and then transform their environments. Wow. So this one slide. As uh, Kim Wheeler told me, she said, after this meeting, 
I found that that was the best day of my life. <laughs> and I said, wow, really? And she said, yeah, you don't know what you just did for this company. And I said, wow, okay, that's my why. That's my why. I was able to change the lives of a whole bunch of people in a company, which was great. It was fun. I don't always get to do that. But I said, you know what? You can do it yourself. I can show you how to do it. So they started doing it themselves. So my job as a consultant usually is to try to get people to do what I do and then have them not meet, need me as fast as I can. That's when I know I've been successful. All right, next case study. And I'm steaming along here, and I'm doing pretty well on time. We're going to have a lot of time for questions, OK? Um, I find that audiences give you really good scores on your evaluation sheets when you finish early. <laughs> so I cut function. <laughs> All right, so this is, uh, this is Mike Lunt, BMC Software. And uh, they build network products for big clients like AT&T. And oh, by the way, these two case studies are in this report. And if you're coming to my class tomorrow, you get one, right? It's XP Scrum, how Agile measures up and what it means to you. You other folks who aren't coming to my class, too bad. <laughs> Just kidding. If you go on a URL, qsma.com backslash Agile report, you can download the PDF, OK? Free. You don't even have to pay for it. Um, BMC software, not co-located, not XP, Scrum teams, seven parallel Scrum teams in four different cities, including India. I said, boy, it'll be interesting to see what this looks like. And so I did a sketch. The story or requirements uh, work in the green with my green marker. Iteration zero, 10 folks, 10 folks, seven folks, five folks for four months. And then the build sprints, 14, 11 iterations, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 9, 10, 11. And then this is the head count here. Not 20, not 26, 93. I said, holy smokes, are you people nuts? Nobody puts 93 people on a release. And they said, well, we're trying. And I said, OK, great, good freaking luck. Um, and I said, why are you doing that? He said, time to market. I said, let me get this straight. You're like doubling staff to try to get the schedule as compressed as you can? And he said, yeah. I said, which way do bugs go? Right? I was like, I can't wait to see this. So we sketched this out. Uh, the requirements phase, it was called elaboration from the carryover from the RUP lingo. Uh, four months. 10 people in one month one, 10 in month two, that's 20 person months, 27, 32. Convert it to hours if you want. You can find out the effort burn for four months to get all the stories laid out. 93 people for five and a quarter months is 488 person months of effort. Wow. To build 100, no, 440 some odd story cards on the infrastructure and solutions side, and then another bunch here for a total of 918 stories. I said, OK, what are you writing this stuff in? Java, XML. I said, wow, I bet it's a ton of functionality. Yeah, for those almost 1,000 stories, it's 834,000 lines of new and changed Java and this much XML. It's almost a million lines of code. Like It's like 900,000 lines of code. And I said, OK. And the defects right there, 635. Now immediately I said, are you sure? And they said, yeah, OK, we'll double check. I said, are you sure? I said, yeah, double check. Because I live in the movie called Groundhog Day. right? When I see 93 people in six months, that number is supposed to be about 2,000 and up. And they said, it's 635. I said, can I see how you, you, you know, what was your whole s strategy on this? And they said, well, we have this. First, we wrote the QA plan. I said, what? They said, yeah, we wrote how we're going to test all of this first. I said, OK, that's different. You know, they said, because we had four teams, seven teams in four different cities, and we knew we were going to be challenged about doing iteration demos and making sure that it all hung together. So our QA strategy, which Dean Leffingwell helped us put together, which Mike Lunt said, um, was really what we wrote first. I said, all right. The bottom line on their two columns, 
The typical project cost for a project of this scale is 5.5 million, 15 months. During DQA, about 700 bugs on average, staffing with 40 people is typical. They did it for 5.2 million, 6.3 months instead of 15. Hyperspeed, they call it like hyper productivity. Their QA defects were 635, which is even lower than the industry average of 713, with a team of 92 people. Now, the key thing is when you double from 40 to 92, this number is supposed to be like 2,000, 3,000, right? So, four times industry average, de average defects when you double the headcount, this would be about 2,800. The fact that it was 630 was the big deal. And that's why they were able to deliver in six and a half months. Because if they had to test 2,700 bugs, they'd, they'd be going way out, right? But somehow they pulled it off. Follett's two dots there for schedule are red. Excuse me, BMCs are red. These green dots are Follett. So I put both sets of constellations of their projects against the QSM trend line for schedule and found how far below that line they were. You can see Follett's schedules are fast, co-located XP, small teams. BMCs is even faster because they're pressing the edge of the envelope. Next one was the Kent Beck criteria on bugs. Uh, Follett's was way down here, if you remember, about 50 to 60 percent fewer bugs. BMC's was right straddling the center of the highway, but they should have been way up here. So the fact that they were right at about the norm with a team of 90 people was a miracle. All right? So what would Ken Beck say on that? Yes. All right, so now we got two case studies, XP and Scrum. It's all written up here, and I asked them, how'd you do it? And um, Dr. Israel Gott, Gatt, who was the vice president of development that did the Agile transformation, uh, he said, in his very thick Israeli accent, I think it's cool to have a name like Israel and have an Israeli accent. He would say, well, you see, we have the secret sauce. Secret sauce? Secret sauce, I said, what's the secret sauce? And so in this report, Mike Lunt wrote the recipe for the secret sauce, right? I won't go into it. Um, but it basically covers some of these concepts. Very short feedback loops, right? Um, in Follett's case, pair programmers provide instant re reviews, code reviews, accelerated learning, face-to-face -face communication. Uh, what would typically take a day to get an answer through an email has happened instantaneously. Domain knowledge by keeping the smartest people in the room. You have all of that information in people's heads that gets to be migrated amongst the team. And basically, software is taking the knowledge in our mind and putting it in a machine. It's like doing a Vulcan mind meld and putting Spock's consciousness inside the code when you think about it. And how to migrate knowledge from a human brain into a machine is the art and the beauty of our profession. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. <laughs> I can't do that, Dave. Right? right? We're creating an intelligence in a machine. Time boxing. Time boxing keeps us focused. In both of these case studies, they said, we didn't want to get too far ahead of ourselves. We really needed to focus and not do that ADD thing and focus on what our next iteration was going to be after this. And so that was a way of prioritizing the functionality, the most important, most valuable ones first. You know, we did that on the nuclear submarine program too. We tackled the stuff that we really had to get nailed down first. And that was before Agile, you know? That was like military DOD 21, mil standard 2167A, you know? So as much as the Agile folks like to be cool, I want to say, you know what, I was cool before you. Uh, avoiding burnout, T my friend Tim Lister, the other guy who has speaking, spoken at this conference, the other fellow who's known with the big hair, and now I'm taking it over because he got a haircut, uh, says a tired mind is an ineffective mind. You know, We make more mistakes when we're tired. When you look at pilot fatigue for airlines uh, and flying planes, there's a reason why there's the FAA rule that after a certain amount of hours, you're out of the cockpit. 
you know. And there's a pilot checklist, actually, that is about checking your fatigue level. Because you just, your, your brain just is in molasses when you're fatigued or jet lagged or something. And so if you're trying to write creative code and be creative when your mind is fatigued, it doesn't work, you know. So whether it's flying a plane, which I love doing and I don't like doing it when I'm tired and I won't, or even driving a car because 43,000 people a year die in car crashes and 430 die in plane crashes. So it's 100 to 1, right? I don't like to do it when I'm tired. Craftsmanship, taking pride of your work. Uncle Bob is a crazy evangelical maniac on this. Uh, written his book, uh, books, things like Clean Code, really says, could you imagine a surgeon going in to operate on someone and not washing their hands? You know, can you imagine taking shortcuts and being sloppy and things like that? You know, so. But we have been encouraged to take shortcuts and be sloppy in the past until we said enough, if we have the ability to do that. And it's about craftsmanship. It's about being proud of what you do. Because if you're writing code where, let's say, it's flying a plane, or you're writing code where it's in a medical device or something, you, know, you don't want it wrong. You know, the sad part about a lot of that is that during the big outsourcing wave, we wound up throwing a lot of that work overseas. And it's not that there weren't smart people there. It's that they were far away and difficult to communicate with and tough to understand, you know? And, you know, and, and, and things that we find it difficult to, to say because we're embarrassed to say it, like, I can't understand their accent. They can't understand my accent, right? So. But that's like politically incorrect to talk about that. But I can do that because I'm Asian, you know? So, you know, and I can take pictures. I have license, license, it's like James Bond, license to kill. I have license to take pictures. Um, but I remember doing a conference call with a team over in Shenzhen, China. And, uh, you know, I'm in my pajamas and it's 11 o'clock at night. And I got, you know, the dogs are in bed and the kids are asleep. And I got my headset on, and I'm beaming way across, which is amazing, this technology. You could give a presentation on the other side of the world in real time. And uh, they had about 45 people in the room, I was told later on, going through my presentation. Um, and uh, when they asked questions, I started getting embarrassed when I had to repeat, you know, say, could you repeat that question, you know? And... After a while, I stopped saying it because I don't like, I'm a people pleaser, so I don't like hurting people's feelings. It's one of my like recovery of being the oldest child compulsive type A personality. I don't like to hurt people's feelings, you know? So I, I felt embarrassed, Chinese are called pachu, uh, afraid to be rude, um, about saying, could you please repeat that? So I stopped asking them to repeat the question. Now, do you think? If I stopped asking them to repeat that question, did I understand what they were saying? Had no idea. Had no idea. So I just like smiled and nodded, you know? Smiled and nodded. It's funny because my, my kid's mom um, was Greek and Irish. And she had a friend who was from Hong Kong who would always come to visit. And Yuet had a very thick accent. And Connie was able to understand Yuet very easily. I don't know why. Maybe it's the Greek-Irish ear she could understand. I have an embarrassing confession. I'm Asian, and I have a really hard time understanding an Asian accent, you know, specifically Chinese. Now, I speak Cantonese, Toy San, Hok San, Mandarin, right? I grew up with all this stuff. But if you take English and put a heavy Chinese accent on it, I'm like, uh. And, and Yuet used to get mad at me. She would say, what's the matter with you? I'm like, I don't know, you know? So it's, it's hard to understand people over long distances in a crackly telephone line and the bugs go up, right? Transparency. Uh, Ken Schwaber at the Path to Agility Conference in Ohio said it's a great uh, floodlight. People who thrive in political machinations and maneuvering and backdoor dealing and, you know, do filibusters and all that stuff hate scrum. They hate transparency. They'll shut you down before they'll 
expose or be transparent. Right? High bandwidth communication, the information is flowing freely. Smart people, uh, it's getting into the code freely, without all the bottlenecks and toll gates and choke points and all that stuff. So that brought me, and this is the, the wrap up of this, to Columbus, Ohio. I, give, I gave this talk as the keynote, Ken Schwaver in the morning, me in the afternoon, and we were at Columbus, Ohio, where they were doing this really remarkable uh, high attention to quality and, and agile in, of all places, Columbus. So we came up with this idea. There's a guy named Ben Blanquera, who's an architect with a company called Pillar Technologies. And we, we called it the Sushi Manifesto. We were eating sushi just uh, before the conference. And he said, you know, there's something special in this Columbus, Ohio community. I wonder what it would look like if we just replicated the kind of measurement capture you do and do a Columbus Agile study. I said, great idea, Columbus versus the world. So we did that. We said, tell you what, everyone, let's do a study and then everybody chip in. So if we get 10 people to do it, you get to like, get the study for one tenth the cost. Anyone in? And they said, yeah. So we collected data from different companies. I went around, I took pictures. Uh, this is a fellow named Dustin Potts at Nationwide Insurance. This is a very relaxed environment in Nationwide. She's so relaxed, she's just totally chill. Uh, this is a fellow named Todd Green at Huntington Bank. Uh, this is another of the environments in Huntington. There's a little QSM folder right there, I noticed. Noise canceling headphones. So, as I said, Agile collects the right metrics for Slim. I said, give us some data, something like this. And so, one client said, four months duration, so it was eight sprints, 10 FTE staff, okay, 40 person months, four months. We delivered 139 stories in the backlog, great. And when we converted to story points on our scale, it turned out to 553. So what would be the average number of story points per story when you eyeball that? Is it two to one? Is it 10 to one? What is it? About five to one, right? Or four and a half, four to one. A little over four and a half to four and a half or to five to one. So that's typically the amount of points per story. And then to deliver that, they wrote this much new code and this much change code in that four month release. When you add those two together, that's the amount of working software to deliver that functionality. And they wanted it to be the least amount of code to deliver that functionality. So they watched continuously where the code was getting fatty and inflated and looking at code per story because simple and elegant design means you could build it as much as you can with as few lines of code as you can, right? It's not like programmers on some conspiracy and jacking up their code counts to look at higher productivity. All due respect to yesterday's speaker who used to think it was a great conspiracy and I would debate Capers Jones on this. I said, people don't have the time to horse around with that crap. They're under a deadline. In fact, most of the time what I see is that they undercode, right? They're rushing it. And then they have to fix the bugs and fill in some gaps. And then defects during QA 45. So we could benchmark that. We could say for this amount of functionality, it's four months faster, slower, 10, month, 10 people more, fewer, 45 bugs more, fewer. And so we did that and got the answer to life, the world, to everything, speed. What's the answer on speed for this collection of companies in Columbus, Ohio? This is the industry average trend line for speed, for time, in months, small releases, medium-sized releases, large releases. So this one was eight months. The industry average was about 12. This one was about one, two, three, four months. Industry average was about 10, nine, eight, seven. If I smack a line through it, boom. That's how much faster I see my schedules. Now, interestingly, if the lines are completely parallel, it's kind of like the same level of schedule uh, advantage across small, medium, and large. But what do you see about the divergence of those lines? Do you see them coming, converging, or are they diverging as they go to larger releases, left to right? They're kind of diverging, right? So the way to interpret this is, as releases get larger, the schedule advantage is even more. 
than on some of the smaller releases. This one, the difference is only a few weeks. This one, we're starting to talk about quite a bit amount of time. Next. Bugs. Fewer defects. But this is getting really serious. If I chart the line between there, we're talking about like one-fourth the number of bugs. So in a typical release, if there's 100, they're seeing about 25 in that final round of testing. That means that their Rayleigh curve in the beginning of the stock has really shrunken down. It's shrunken down by a factor of four. Hmm. I aim for quality, I get schedule. If I put my QA people as stakeholders in the front of the conversation, I get it in the back end. Right, so. And that's a summary. Yep. Excellent question. It's, it's the most common question. So the question is, if we're talking about pair programming, I got it, gather from your question that is it being not fully reported? Like they're finding and fixing it, and so when, what are we seeing there? Um, in the beginning, they're just finding and fixing it. But what we're looking at here is the formal testing at the end when the system is in a production environment, and it's the bugs that got through. So that was four times fewer. And then uh, the system was released. So that's an excellent question. Um, Bottom line is 75% fewer defects. I almost think that this is like crazy unbelievable. 30% um, faster schedule. So in this environment, for every 10 months, they're doing it in seven. Follett was cutting it even further. Um, BMC was cutting it even further. Uh, but the bug rates are far below industry average. Question. Right. Okay. So the question is, what about in these particular industries, would they get different results in other industries? Is that your question? Yeah. Well, it would be interesting to see. Yes. Okay, so the question was, what would we see in different industries? And that's the $64,000 question. I don't have the answer to all of that. Because as we see more uh, data lighting up in different industries, the answer will come. I know that when I was working on real-time embedded geophysical navigation systems on submarines, this was working for us. This happens to be business information systems in the financial services, banking, and insurance industries. Okay, so more IT on this. So the question is, would we see it everywhere? Well, that's the question for you. So for folks in this room, if you raise, if you typically did a census about what world you live in, we can get that answer. And if you're in the workshop tomorrow, we might even take a sneak peek. So my last closing slides is, is wait, there's more. What about you? So thank you very much. Um, Maybe we'll find out that there are different degrees of goodness, or maybe not, depending on what the soup is in that pot. Uh, maybe there are some unique challenges. I know in medical devices, there's the FDA certification phase at the end, and one company I'm working with says, that block of time with the schedule is like not in our control, right? Whether it goes fast or slow is depending on someone else. So there could be some industry unique type of attributes with that, but we'll find out. We now have trends for Agile in our 8.1 release of the SLIM model, so that if you want to just look at Agile to Agile, you can do that apples to apples, or by industry, business, IT, system software, military systems, real-time embedded. I'm curious. I don't know about you, but part of what's interesting to me is to find out what the other stories are out there in the world. So again, I'm fundamentally a storyteller. I kind of go around to these different places and then I share what I see 
and see if we can give some takeaways. And so that's what I do. I like to find out whether, you know, show me the monkey, right? I don't know where I got this. <laughs> show me the data. Show me the monkey, right? Show me the money. So maybe that's it. Show me the money. Show me the monkey. So what if we did a Portland Agile benchmark study? I don't know. Anyone wants to kick around that idea? I'm into it. You know, we could say if we get enough interest and attention on this from tomorrow's workshop and other people, and you say, yeah, let's do this. Let's kind of like take a confidential uh, sneak peek because no one knows whose dots are whose when we do a scatter diagram. It's just a bunch of blue dots. So confidentiality is completely honored. And at the same time, when we get this transparency and we want to share it just privately among your team, you can light up those that belong to you in red and you can see which one are mine and then get a sense of what's going on. Uh, now, do what you want with it. You know, and some people want to look and some people like say, God, we stink. You know, I don't even want to look. You know, like when I first had to get my cholesterol tested, I was like, I don't want to know, you know, back when I was eating a lot of cheeseburgers. But then when I found out, I was like, I better stop eating those cheeseburgers. <laughs> so that's it. Um, lastly, if you think this idea of doing a Portland study might like be a good idea, email me, michael.mottqsma.com, um, and we can talk it over. Last couple of tidbits. To take to as takeaways, and then we'll open it up for conversation early because we're done. I always find that when I'm in hurry up mode, I screw something up so badly that I got to go back, and it takes me actually longer than when I was hurrying up. Classic example is when I'm racing out of the house and go like, "Oh crap! I left my cell phone, you know, in the kitchen," and then I got to go all the way back, you know, or I forget to do something. And then it creates a problem for me. Um, so interestingly, I think our obsession with speed actually works against us and makes us go slower. So I think sometimes you have to slow down to go fast. And when we think about that and say building, building features and functionality at a sustainable pace, the bugs are lower and ultimately we deliver the system sooner. So slow down or die. Build a little less. My friend Tom DeMarco used this trick once in a talk, and he said, this is a 15 puzzle. A lot of little kids will like sliding around the tiles, getting it in the right order, one, two, three, four, five, and getting the colors in two rows, yellow and white. What's the key to doing this puzzle? What's the key to being able to solve this puzzle? You won't move one piece at a time, yes. Anything else? Plan ahead, move things in circles. Anything else? Take all the tiles out and put them back in? Anything, anyone else? Order? Yeah, get the order right. That's the ultimate end goal of the. But what's the key to getting to even. Huh? There's an open space, there's a missing tile. There's a spot where you can move stuff around. In software, the problem with our greedy wish to have more and more is that we put in 17 tiles when there's only 16 that could fit. And we try to figure out, why can't we solve this? So build a little less, build a little less. You know, quality and quantity are inversely related. If you want higher quality, build less quantity, right? Have some room to move the tiles around. You small A-teams. Right? We know that if we use large teams of people and try to compress the schedule, the books go up geometrically. So, duh! What should we do? For the most part, use small teams if you want quality. Right? The smallest minimum size team that you can get. Build a little less. And that's it. Thank you. Now we can talk. I'm from New York. Someone actually came up to me last week and said, let me guess, Indonesia, right? I said, no, New York. Forget about it. New York. Questions? Right here. Tom.
<laughs> well, I already answered that. The question is, would you feel it's appropriate for mission critical stuff? Um, well, I think I think the question is, should the practices like co-locating people, you know, working at a sustainable pace, all right, uh, putting them, co um, mm -hmm. you know, working on one thing. And if that's mission critical, I would say those practices are something we would want to do. Don't multitask. Get the smartest people you can. Put them in the wrong room. Steve Jobs did that with the, the Mac architecture, right? So when the Macintosh was created, he took his smartest people. If you read the biography, anyone read the biography? Steve Jobs. Remember the Texaco Towers, right? It was a non indiscreet room, uh, building near a Texaco gas station. We got the smartest folks, put them in one room, one place, and said, figure out how to make a Macintosh. And I would say that that was pretty mission critical because Apple was about to go out of business. I wish I bought the stock when it was 19. So the, the question... Yeah, the question is, is uh, I guess evolving requirements appropriate for mission critical? It, it depends. I mean, I certainly think that um, you'll have to look at your own environment. Some people just want to experiment with it for a while before they, you know, do it on something super important. And if you're at that level, fine. You know, try it out for a while. Test it out before you go whole hog. I mean, if you're not ready and you're not mature in a lot of these kinds of practices and you just wink, you know, throw it on it, that could be a little tricky. So, but that's a different, that's a whole different challenge. I'm just reporting on what we're seeing when people uh, are employing these practices in terms of the Kent Beck criteria. So, but it's, it's, wor it's a worthy question. Uh, next question, we got one there, a couple here. Next, over there and then here. Yep. Oh, Capers was here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, Function Points was by Al Albrecht in the 1980s in the IBM <laughs> Create, Read, Update, Delete against a large database, which was IBM mainframes. And so the view of the world back then was through the lens of an IBM mainframe. So fast forward 30 years later, if Function Points in their function providing elements fits in your world, let's say you're still building batch processing IBM mainframes, then you could size it in function points. Agile teams have, for the most part, created their story point scale, right? So you say, this is a feature or a use case or a requirement, you know, and we're going to rank them by simple average complex on a scale 1 to 3, 1 to 7, 1 to 10, or Fibonacci if you like Italian food, and, uh, and then figure out scope from that scale. I'm not seeing anyone really use function points. Well, you could, you could, you could, first of all, we have function point trends. So the answer is yes. I mean, if you wanted to, like, count in function points and slap it up where the x-axis is not meters versus miles, you know, not code versus function points, you could do that. So we have that. Yeah. Well, that's useful to know because let's say you build a certain amount of functionality, but your schedules are influenced by a lot of this other stuff. So instead of six months, you take eight months because of all those attributes to build that amount of functionality. That's important to know. We have other things that are configuration or stuff like that. But uh, you're talking about you know different work effort versus the different size of things. So what I find is important is capture it all and then see what it looks like and then rather than hypothesize about what about, let's see what it is, and then try to understand what the pattern is. That's where you get a little bit of the art into interpreting why your dots are here versus there. But typically we see, you know, if schedules are fast and effort is low and bugs are low, that's a good thing. If schedule is fast but effort is high because you use large teams and bugs are high, that's predictable. So all of the patterns of where these things move tend to move in sync with each other. Uh, and, and in your world, they're going to move in sync in different ways because of those things. So, good question. Next, because we still have quite a few, we have about five more minutes, a few more minutes. 
three more minutes. I'm getting old. I can't see my watch. Good question. Are defects fa found uh, re recorded both before elevate and after? Yes, because let's say you have testing and the bugs are one fourth the industry average, but then you release it and it sucks. You know that tells you something. Um, or if you have a lot of bugs that you found in QA and then after elevate, bug free, that tells you another something. So it's important to see at both sides of the toss it over the fence. Good question. Here. Oh, the, the report. Uh, well, first, our website is QSM Associates, QSMA.com, and then backslash agile report, all one word lowercase. And you'll, you'll be asked to put in a username and then a password, and it's both Agile Report and Agile Report. And we tell you that. <laughs> uh, and then you'll get the PDF. Um, so there. Thank you for reminding me. There's more details in here that you can get in a 90 minute. More questions. Wow. Yes, ma'am. Lean Kanban, yeah, we're starting to see more of that. Uh, so I think every different flavor of how systems are designed will start flowing into the QSM database. Uh, we could probably do like a filter and say, let's look at the Lean Kanban patterns. And that's the fun part of all this. It's ever growing and ever changing. So one of our clients actually has a set of custom filter tags where they want to tag whether it's a standing team or a cross-functional team, or it's Kanban, or XP, or Scrum, or this, or that, and that. And then we color code the different, you know, pieces of the scatter diagram by red, green, orange, you know. And then you can see where the constellations are moving by the different practices. And then that gives you some insights into the different styles. So I think that's a good idea. Another, we got one and two. So let's go back there, and then you... Good question. So the question is for people on the remote feeds. Um, when you do a study, uh, and I'm, I'm translating what I think you said, is how do you deal with the fact that people measure things differently or they might interpret or define things differently? There's some basic things that are you know, standard, like start and end dates give us the elapsed time. That's pretty straightforward. The other thing that's usually tricky is how do you count effort hours? So uh, if it says dedicated team of 10 people, it's different than if 10 people are working on two projects at once, because then the equivalent numbers of headcount may be five. And so the hours should be cut in half. So it's full-time equivalent for hours, and then elapsed time. And then there's bugs that we typically like to establish a consistent window uh, at about the seventh sprint out of 10 for the last lap of the relay race. So during QA, typically, and then one month after. So we find that it's more inconsistent when you're looking at before formal testing. So during formal testing, we'll say bugs, uh, severity level is another good thing. You know, showstoppers, severity high, medium, low. So we go through that, and uh, we'll do this in the workshop tomorrow, too. We'll talk about consistency of terms and units so that we're not having apples and oranges. Like when the Mars rover crashed, it's because they were using velocity in you know, kilometers versus miles. Don't get your units wrong. Yes, Ed. Good. Good question. Is it all roses and music and dancing fairies? Not always. And sometimes that's the difficult conversation when people are like really proud of something and you're like, well, something's not quite right here. So the first time I actually presented some of this research data it was Agile Patterns at five companies and two of my poster children were Follett and BMC. The other three were not and we found patterns that weren't so hot. So for example, among those dots, the schedules were fast but they still used larger teams. Hmm. And then when we looked at the bug rates for that other three groups of companies, they were higher than the industry average. 
So that was a little tricky to say that in Kent Beck's speak, you were missing on criteria two. Your bugs were not lower, they were higher. And that's not supposed to be, right? That's why we're doing Agile. We're trying to build clean code. And so, uh, and the thing about those companies is they were really just getting into the whole learning curves in the first place. Uh, and they hadn't quite overcome it. We are over and into the break. Woo! Um, I hope that it was for a good purpose was to take your questions. I'm sorry we can't take any more. I'll be around the rest of the day. Thanks.